During the 1960s, one man would leave a trail of destruction across Victoria that would span 20 years. After the bodies were found, well, everything really got worse and worse. Her throat has been cut from ear to ear. She had obviously been sexually assaulted. The killer's identity would remain a mystery, and he would be known only by a nickname. The name Mr Stinky was created because some of the victims described a smell, but they couldn't nail what the smell was. A chance discovery would eventually lead police to one of Australia's most prolific sexual predators. I saw the print on the window of the car and thought, oh, I've seen that before. And chilling revelations from the killer himself. He said, get me a priest and I'll tell you everything. The murders and rapes committed by Raymond Edmonds were crimes that shook Australia. The town of Shepparton lies almost 200 kilometres northeast of Melbourne. In the 1960s, it was a flourishing agricultural town with a booming population. Shepparton in the 1960s was a thriving regional centre. It was the hub of a vast farming area, orchards, all that sort of thing. You felt like you knew everybody and you were safe and uh, it was involved in sport and just community activity. It was a good place to be. As a teenager in the 1960s, in Shepparton, we would go to dances, concerts. 66 in Shepparton, as it was around really the Western world, was the boom time for rock and roll. Big bands would come to Shepparton because it had a great big memorial hall and they knew they could draw thousands of kids from across the entire district. It was exciting and, uh, you know, you'd be looking around and you'd be seeing all these young people that were just so happy and so glad to be there. It was, it was really fun. On the 10th of February, 1966, locals in Shepparton were preparing for a rock and roll concert at the dance hall. One of them was 16-year-old Abina Medill. She always looked like she was having the best time. She'd smile all the time and giggle and laugh. And she was definitely enjoying her teenage years. She certainly wasn't boisterous or noisy, just a, a, a typical shepherd and kid, you could say, and uh, loved life, attractive, she was popular. Abina had recently started a relationship with Ian Urquhart, an apprentice mechanic from the town who was two years older than her. Ian was a, a very happy, jovial person. He was always into doing pranks and he was just, uh, just absolutely full of life. He was a happy-go-lucky sort of a kid, not much worried him. He was into motors and things like that. He, he'd done his apprenticeship. Because he was so small, I used to get in a few bloody brawls because he, he'd get picked on a bit. He was a good mate. He was probably, back in them days, uh, my best mate. Bina was the first girlfriend he ever had. They have know each other, they've got together, they've gone out a little bit. On the night of the concert, Ian Urquhart decided he needed to work late at the garage, so he arranged to meet his girlfriend, Abina, later that evening. He was very keen on cars and uh, actually he was a workaholic. He, he would have worked instead of going to the concert. What Ian didn't know was that Abina had arranged to meet with another local boy, Gary Haywood, who she worked with at the local panel beaters. Gary Haywood was one of the uh, young bucks around town. He was well known. For a start, his family were very well established in Shepparton. His family, the Haywoods, owned the big panel beating works. As such, he was sort of Shepparton royalty in a, 
you know, in a way. And he was the tall, good-looking young bloke. He had the good FJ Holden, which was the, the much coveted old car at the time that would be done up. He'd, turn, he'd spray painted it. He was as proud as punch when he drove his car and he sort of drove around saying, hey, look at me, you know, I've got the good car and I work in a pretty well-known panel beating business and he had the world at his feet too, I guess. Abina Medill has arranged with the female friend to meet Haywood and his mates and they've arranged to meet them down the street and then to go to the dance. And Abina apparently goes off with Gary and they go parking down near the lake. Abina and Gary were never seen alive again. Later that evening, Ian Urquhart went to pick up Abina from her home as planned, but unable to find her, he became increasingly worried. Here we have Ian Urquhart, very anxious about his girlfriend. He finds out fairly swiftly that she's been knocking around with Haywood and his mates. So he was very angry about this. Uh, by midnight, people are getting anxious. Mr Medill uh, is worried because his daughter hasn't come home. By three o'clock, Mr Medill has filed a missing persons report. Now, I was working the night shift at 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. when we received a phone call from the Medill family uh, that their daughter hadn't returned home. It was completely out of character for her that she didn't come, sort of come straight home after she'd been, say, to the local dance. We immediately suspected something, it was just that feeling there was something not quite right. Now, the night is a, a mystery. The young Urquhart is running around looking for his girlfriend. Meanwhile, Abina's father is frantically looking, worried about his daughter and looking. Gary Haywood's father, Mr Haywood, and, and Gary's younger brother, Alan, are looking for Gary and his car. Everybody's very, very disturbed because this is well out of the ordinary. After searching all night and, and knowing that she was with Gary Haywood, uh, I then knew that uh, she was possibly in the car, which was well known to the police. It was an early model Holden car with a very loud exhaust, uh, painted in a, what they'd call probably British green, and there was only two to that colour and the same model in Shepparton and we knew both cars. So it then became obvious that we were probably looking for Gary Haywood's car. And at 5am I'd uh, dropped my partner off, he'd finished his shift and as I was returning to the police station when I came across Gary Haywood's car which was parked at an angle in Wyndham Street opposite the lake. The discovery of Haywood's car was the police's first real clue and the breakthrough they were desperate for. It's pulled up quite roughly by the curb. It's not parked properly and there's no key in the ignition, but it's unlocked. The people that knew Gary, they, they knew that he wouldn't have left his car anywhere. The boys back then, their cars were an extension of themselves. So as soon as they saw it, they knew that someone else had driven a car and therefore they grew very fearful. A lot of people were saying and thinking they've just run off together. And that is what the people that knew them well were hoping for because if they ran off together, they'd still be okay. The parents of both Gary and Abina are by no means reassured by this. Although they hope it's true, something tells them that it isn't. Two weeks later, and after a desperate and exhaustive search, the worst fears of Gary and Abina's friends and family would come true. On February the 10th, 1966, two teenagers disappeared from Shepparton, Victoria, after attending a concert in the town. Only hours after they were reported missing, people began to fear the worst. The disappearance of Gary Haywood and Abina Medill was a big story. People were very worried about it. It was headline news. There were big searches mounted. There, you know, all the um, workers from Haywood's panel works went out and combed the river flats. Mounted police came, I think. The local pony club went out on horses. 
People went out with dogs and sticks to keep the snakes away, looking through the long grass, looking for the missing teenagers. They find nothing. But a couple of days later, an old local fellow who's riding his bike across a bridge well away from Shepparton, he looks down into the dry creek bed and he sees a handbag. He goes down and picks it up and gives it to the police and it turns out to be a Venus handbag. So that is a, yet another indicator that something bad has happened. A search of the riverbed and the surrounding area provided no further clues. But the recovery of a Venus handbag meant the spotlight of suspicion was focused more and more on one person. From the first night of the disappearance, Ian Urquhart is blamed. He's the one with the motive, it would seem. Ian came under further suspicion when the police learnt about an outburst he made when he was told his girlfriend Abina had, in fact, spent the evening with Gary Haywood. The police were parked outside the Medill's house. He got out of the car and he ran towards, he may not have presumed it was a police car, and he said, I will kill the bastard. That would be just a, a word that was used flippantly. I think Ian might have brought that on himself by saying those words, but that's the sort of thing I think often anyone would say when you're upset, I'll get him or whatever. But it might have been a throwaway line, but it obviously <laughs> didn't help him. Sixteen days after the mysterious disappearance of teenagers Gary Haywood and Abina Medill, a gruesome discovery was made on a rural property 40 kilometres south of Shepparton. On the 26th of February, two young teenagers are going shooting. They go to a place called Murchison East, which is on the way to Shepparton, and they cut across country to go shooting near the Goulburn River. During that time, they smell something bad. They discover a Bena's body. They're terrified and horrified. They run across country. They alert the grandfather of one of the boys. We got a phone call from a farmer at, uh, down at Murchison to tell us that one of his young relatives had come across what he believed was human remains. I, with, with other police, then attended the scene. We located the body of the female, which was in a, a very, very bad state of decomposition. Further out in, the, in a paddock, we found the body of, of Gary Haywood. The police were soon able to establish that Abena had probably been raped. She was found stripped to the waist. She'd been bashed to death, um, presumably with a rifle, because they found the part of a rifle left there. And when they found uh, Gary 300 metres from her body, they soon realised that uh, he'd been shot because they saw a bullet hole in his temple. When I heard the bodies had been found, I think I went into a kind of a, uh, a bubble. I, I couldn't believe it. Even though, by, this, by that time, we were expecting something like that. I was playing tennis down at the Lawn Tennis Club here, and, and uh, the word just whipped around the tennis courts like mad, and... It was heartbreaking, is what it was. It just... You get this physical pain. And she was such a beautiful girl. You don't... You don't know how, what to do or what to say. Or you, and you can't feel anything but... pain. It really set us back. It, it was just something that's never happened in our lives. We never lost anyone. And uh, to have something like that happen was completely unbelievable. Finding the bodies, all it did was confirm that these, this couple had in fact been murdered. 
which was what people were starting to assume. But it didn't put Ian in the clear. It just meant that he was now a full-blown suspect for a double murder. And the police did look at a lot of other people. They questioned many people. But they kept coming back to him because he seemed to be the obvious person with a motive. He was persecuted by a lot of people. And if I'm allowed to say, I think the police as well hounded him. After the bodies were found, well, everything really got worse and worse. The police were really desperate because it was headline news for weeks. They had to come up with something. And that's why they were trying to break him to get some sort of a, a lead or something happening that, that they were doing their job and that it will, we will solve this. Someone done this and we reckon you're the one. When Ian got taken down to the police station and interviewed, he got hit and slapped and kicked in different ways. He used to tell me about it. I said, that surely couldn't happen, and, and uh, it did. And um, he was scared. He was really scared. Ian came home one day and he said to me, that's it, I'm going to tell them I did it. Well, you could imagine what I went through, trying to <sighs> tell him not to do that. That's what they wanted. They're really working hard on Urquhart because they think if they belt him enough and his mates enough that in the end one of them will just say, yeah, we did it, or he did it, or something. The way Ian Urquhart was treated by police should never happen to anyone. Simple reason is you're found guilty, then that's the way you've got to be treated. But until you're found guilty, no one should be treated like Urquhart was treated. Whilst Urquhart was the prime suspect, another vital clue the police had was the rifle part found at the scene. It was obvious to the police that the murder weapon was a Mossberg rifle because they found a little piece of, of a Mossberg that had fallen off the rifle. They also were able to find empty shells and they could look at the firing pin marks on those shells. They were also able to remove a slug from Gary Haywood's body and examine that microscopically. All those things added up to a particular model Mossberg 22 rifle. The Mossberg was a terrific clue. And in the right hands, given some luck, it would have led fairly quickly to a potential killer. And it would later turn out that it had been sold to a particular person at a particular shop and there should have been records of that transaction. But the police, for some reason, never found that out or found it out and didn't act on it. Despite this missed opportunity, the police did have another lead, a set of fingerprints found on Gary Haywood's car, but they didn't match any of the current suspects. Little did the police know that 20 years later, these same fingerprints would be rediscovered and used to crack the case. Of course, this was of little comfort to prime suspect Ian Urquhart. Although not charged with anything, the weight of suspicion proved to be a heavy burden for the teenager. Ian's life was affected dramatically. He felt that he could no longer live in the town. He just said, I've had enough. He said, I've got to go. And I said, but where are you going to go? He said, I don't know, I'm going to go. It was a situation where he was tormented badly. He wanted to come home. If he came home, he was damned. Well, how should he show his face here anymore? And if he stayed away, he's done it because, uh, you know, he's run away from the situation. Ian Urquhart decided to leave Shepparton and Australia. He headed overseas and tried to leave the awful events of his hometown in his past. As time moved on, so too did the media attention, which was soon focused on another terrible series of events 
160 kilometers away. Donvale is in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne near Templestowe, Doncaster, and it's probably an affluent, a wealthy type of area. The demography of a place like Donvale was young marrieds. There were a lot of young mothers there, women in their 20s with little kids whose husbands had jobs that were predictable hours. They would go off to work at seven in the morning or whatever it might be and be gone for a long time because they'd have to go a long way to work and then drive home. In the mid-1970s, this quiet residential area was being terrorised by a serial sexual predator. Women started coming forward to police with tales which were uncommonly similar. The method of entry into the house was almost identical every time. The attacker was a man who was generally barefoot. He was very quiet, quietly spoken, moved very silently with his bare feet. The words said by the offender were very, very similar. Some women noticed he carried a long butcher's knife, a long narrow knife, such as is used by meat workers. The name Mr Stinky was created because some of the women, in fact, described a smell, but they couldn't nail what the smell was. A sort of a sharp, nasty chemical smell, perhaps a bit like ammonia. This story made the media big time, and it was a sub-editor on a Sunday paper in Melbourne was trying to write a headline for it and looking for a nickname for this unknown rapist. And they were, they were doodling names, and they're going, Mr Smelly, Mr Pongo, and in the end he wrote Mr Stinky, and it fitted the gap, and it entered the lexicon. Although no one could describe the smell with certainty, all the victims reported the rapist smelled of a pungent and unpleasant odour. This ever-present clue in the victim's statements pointed to one conclusion. Police were looking for one man. Police files would eventually contain details of over 30 attacks that detectives attributed to the rapist. Eventually, the police are so keen to catch this man that they build a bust or an effigy of him based on the eyewitness of several victims. So they get a rather thick-set, pot-bellied looking man, sandy to red hair, a long, straight nose, pasty sort of guy. They went to a massive amount of trouble, but it didn't turn up the lead that they desperately needed. As detectives carried on in their diligent efforts to track the Donvale rapist, what they couldn't have realised was that in June 1982, their case was about to collide headlong with a long-forgotten double murder from 1966. In the early 1980s, Victoria Police were investigating a series of rapes in the Donvale area of Melbourne that took place between 1971 and 1977. The perpetrator left little in the way of evidence, but through patient detective work, police were on the verge of a breakthrough. The unifying thing about the attacks, apart from the method, was that there weren't a lot of clues left, but the police, through diligent fingerprint work, were able to build up a composite of fingerprints. So they'd find one thumbprint here, one index finger there, and they'd get one from a window, one from a windowsill, and gradually they assembled a composite set of prints which they just named the Donvale Rapist. The use of fingerprints was still in its infancy in the 1980s. It was still pretty much the same as it was at the turn of the um, 19th century. There was no computers, so there was no scanning of, of images or photos or even fingerprint forms. The Medill Haywood murder at Shepparton had sort of receded into the distance. By the time we get to the early 80s, it's sort of ancient history. There'd never been any breakthroughs until the day comes when a young fingerprint expert has been looking at some old cold case stuff. He's been flicking through unsolved cases and the prints that are associated with each cold case. On one particular day, I was looking through the, the folder for Shepparton. And as I was looking through, I saw the prints on the window of the car and thought, oh, I know, I've seen that before. And sure enough, he digged through his files and bingo, 
same prints as left on Gary Hayward's car, and that was a huge breakthrough and gave us hope that uh, there was going to be an end to the, the mystery. Despite using nothing more than a keen eye for detail, an incredible amount of patience and a huge stroke of luck, Andrew Wall had stumbled on a match between the prints found at the Donvale rape crime scenes and those found on Gary Hayward's car in 1966. This was an amazing breakthrough. The police now knew that the Donvale rapist was at least present at the time of the Shepherd and murders back in 1966 because they'd matched up a tiny fingerprint found on Gary Haywood's car, a fingerprint that had been kept secret for 17 years. Although we had that link and it gave uh, investigators something more to work with, we didn't know who it was or who they belonged to. The discovery prompted the police to form a task force in May 1983 to find out who the prints belonged to. Norm Gillespie worked on the team. The tragic murders from his childhood in Shepparton had inspired him to join the police. He was now working on the very case he was witness to so many years before. We knew everything about him but except who he was. It was frustrating. And, but we kept working and kept, you know, kept chipping away at it and we had no luck and the offender had all the luck. With few leads left to explore, the task force was wound down. It seemed the killer had slipped the net once more. That was until two years later, when a local in the town of Albury, almost 250 kilometres from Donvale and across the border into New South Wales, made a call to the police. It's March the 16th, 1985. A shop assistant in Main Street, Albury, looks out and sees a man exposing himself in a car parked in the street. She calls the local police. A phone call came into the police station to say that some ladies in the store had complained about a male seated in a vehicle and the male had allegedly, at that stage, been exposing himself. We arrived just before 12.30pm. I approached the car and observed what he was doing in the vehicle, masturbating, and I said to him, what are you doing that for? He immediately turned around, turned his head to the right where I was. We asked him his name and he told me his name was Raymond Edmonds. They take him in and charge him with willful and obscene exposure, a pretty simple offence. They routinely fingerprint him. Now, this man had never been fingerprinted before in his life. He's a man in his early 40s. They put the ink on his fingers, they put it on the pad, they put it on the white paper, they send it off to Fingerprint Central and it finds its way through the system. He was actually bailed to appear at the um, Albury local court on the Monday, the 18th of March. And in fact, he did appear there and he was fined. He pleaded guilty to the charge of willful and obscene exposure. He was given a $400 fine by the magistrate, Mr Werry, and we didn't think anything more of it. Edmund's prints made their way to the Central Fingerprint Bureau in Sydney, where, incredibly, they were spotted by a diligent detective. As he processed them, he noticed they matched a set of prints he'd been given by Victoria police officers eight months earlier, during their search for the Donvale rapist. Finally, detectives had their man. I was at home and... Uh, I received a call from the, the Fingerprint Bureau who um, excitedly said, we've got him. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, they said, uh, Mr Stinky, he's been printed in Albury. Now, after two years of hard work and a huge piece of good fortune, detectives could match Raymond Edmonds' fingerprints to those found at the Donvale rape scenes and the print they found on Gary Haywood's car back in 1966. After two decades, a double murderer and serial rapist who had remained anonymous for so long had just blundered into the hands of police. Edmonds was a man that most men did not like. He was quiet, he was moody, he was a bit different in ways that people found hard to put their finger on. Women 
had mixed reactions. Some women, some women seemed to quite like him and were sort of attracted to him. Many women found him scary, sinister, didn't like him, found him creepy. He was a man who'd been very careful to airbrush his own history. So if he went and worked somewhere, when asked where he'd worked before, he would alter it. He would make up false details, false addresses, false places of work, so that wherever he'd been, he laid a false trail, which of course is an indicator of guilt. Investigators uncovered a story of an apparently ordinary working man who harboured a terrible secret. He was a violent sexual deviant who'd beaten and raped his first wife and also molested his daughter. On the 22nd of March 1985, detectives were finally able to arrest the man who they'd been looking for for almost 20 years. So, March the 22nd, 1985, six days after the Albury incident, the Victorian police are all over it. They know where Edmunds works. They go down to a small factory in the Bayside suburb of Hyatt and they go in and there in the office is Raymond Edmonds. He says, what can I do for you, gentlemen? And then they arrest him. I was surprised why we hadn't had him earlier because he looked so much like the circular that girls put together and it was distributed on the highways in Melbourne and on police circulars. I was amazed someone hadn't telephoned us and told us who he was. My boss conducted sort of a, a pre-interview question and, and actually put it to Raymond Evans and said, I put it to you that these fingerprints are yours. There was some silence for quite some time and, and um, a, a shake of the head denial. Edmonds was reluctant to divulge anything much, uh, but he seemed to undergo a change of heart or more likely he realised that they had him cold. My boss put it to him again, in which Edmonds, and it still sticks in my mind now, said, um, Get me a priest and I'll tell you everything. After speaking to a priest, Edmonds began to talk, but the police were well aware that they only had a limited time to question him. There are rules in Victoria which limit the amount of time that a suspect can be questioned about a particular crime. Now, the police can get some extensions. They can do it for six hours and then get an extension. So in effect, we had him for 18 hours, but that was nowhere near enough time to process him for the double murders plus all the rapes in Melbourne, we just didn't have the time. We only had time to process him on five of 30, but he admitted them. He said, yes, I committed them, but we didn't have enough time to find out how did you choose that victim? How long had you been watching her? How did you know the husband would be away or the kids would be in the next room? We didn't have time. Detectives were only able to put forward five of the 30 rape cases to Edmonds, plus the double murder in Shepparton. His response to the charges was that he was sick in the head and needed destroying. Although he agreed to take part in a reconstruction to help investigators piece together the events that led to the murders of Medill and Hayward, police were beginning to realise that his statement was riddled with lies. Edmonds had claimed that the gun he used in the killings was actually Gary Haywood's, but the police could prove otherwise. One of the key parts of the evidence is the 22 Mossberg. Now, Edmonds initially denies ever having had one, but of course the police are able to go back and show that he did have one. They go to the farm at Ardmona near Shepparton where he'd been a share milker in 1966, at the time of the double murder. And there they find the farmer's son, who'd been a young man back in 66, and he's now, you know, in his 40s or whatever. And he says, oh, yeah, I remember him. He had this Mossberg rifle. It was one with a fold-out handle. I remember it well. We used to shoot rabbits and rats and all that. And in fact, he said, hang on, he said to the police, I might have a bit of that somewhere. I found something I thought it was an old uh, air rifle stock. I found it in a shed after Ray left, Raymond's had left, and I kept it all these years. And he goes out to a shed and he gets a bucket and in the bucket is this piece of gun stock. And as soon as the expert ballistics guy saw it, he said, that's from a Mossberg 
352 k and that's the weapon. We were told, and it's been confirmed, that he shot this same firearm at tins on a fence post. And of course the spent shells must go somewhere. So we got excavators, we dug up all the area in which he was standing at the time and all that soil was brought into Shepparton. It was sieved physically, standing there, shaken <laughs> the sieves and the spent shells dropped through. Our ballistics expert was able to say categorically it was the same firearm that discharged the spent shells at Ardmona as at the murder scene at Murchison East. They were able to find out that he indeed, although he denied owning a Mossberg 22 rifle, in fact he had owned precisely the model of rifle, a 352 k Mossberg, that was the murder weapon. As police prepared for trial, they began to uncover more about Raymond Edmonds and his history of violence. What's more, they began to suspect he may have been responsible for even more horrifying crimes. After almost 20 years, police finally had the suspected killer of Shepparton teenagers Abina Medill and Gary Haywood in custody and ready for trial. The weight of evidence against Raymond Edmonds finally lifted the cloud of suspicion that for so long had hung over Abina's boyfriend, Ian Urquhart. Ian Urquhart, the boyfriend, the innocent boyfriend who was wrongly accused and wrongly blamed and widely blamed for the murders for years and years. In fact, for the rest of his life, because he died six years after the murders, on the sixth anniversary of the murders, he crashed his MG sports car in Singapore and died. Now, whether there was any connection between the anniversary and his death, I don't know. But even at his funeral in Shepparton, a policeman who had led the interrogation of Ian Urquhart was still blaming him and said, well, he's got his right whack now, but he was wrong. It wasn't Ian Urquhart. A tragic figure in every way. The day the news came through that someone had been arrested for the murders of Abina and Gary, we were all so happy, full, full of emotion, tears, and um, probably a, a big weight lifted off all of our shoulders. All of a sudden, all those people that had wrongly condemned my brother, at least after all those years, that question had been answered, that he was, as I used to say, totally innocent of the crime. On the 3rd of April, 1986, Raymond Edmonds appeared at Melbourne Supreme Court, charged with two counts of murder, three counts of rape, and two counts of attempted rape. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to two terms of life in prison for the murders and 30 years for the five rape charges. He will die in prison, but the question remained, could the so-called Mr. Stinky have been responsible for any other crimes? What happens with these cases is that police then start combing through their records looking for unsolved cases that might match up the MO of the crook. And one that stood out to everybody concerned was a chilling murder in 1980 of a woman called Elaine Jones. She was a young mother, an attractive woman. She's uh, holidaying at a, a, a Murray River town called Tokemall. It was in early January, 1980. Elaine Jones and her husband had been staying on holidays uh, on the main beach at Token Wall, approximately 10 p.m. She realised, look, we're out of milk and um, we need to get some cigarettes as well. I'll go up to the local shop. It's only, it wasn't a very long walk. So she headed off to the shop about 10 p.m. We know that apparently she made it to the shop, but she never made it back to the, to the campsite. When Elaine Jones disappeared, her husband did not alert the police until next day. He'd hoped she would turn up. She doesn't turn up. Next morning, he tells the police. He then goes searching for her himself. He's in a boat. He's got his seven-year-old daughter 
and horror of horrors, he finds her body. Her throat has been cut from ear to ear, right through to the spinal cord. Mr Jones is highly distressed when he sees his wife with his little girl there. He covers her body with life jackets and turns the boat around to go and get help when he has a massive heart attack and dies. The boat continues on for some minutes. The poor little seven-year-old girl actually ends up scrambling out of the boat and getting to the shore and saving herself, having seen her mother's body and seen her father die of the heart attack from the shock. It was established at a post-mortem that Elaine Jones had not only been a severely, severe laceration to the throat, cut from ear to ear, she'd also been the victim of quite a horrendous beating with a blunt object or instrument to her head and I believe she was also established that she'd been sexually assaulted. I've always believed that Elaine Jones up at Tokemall in 1980 is a victim of our same Raymond Edmonds. Raymond Edmonds was staying in close proximity to that picnic area to, uh, in Tokemall at the time and, and on the night. He was quite close in vicinity to where Elaine Jones was attacked and murdered. We know for absolute fact Raymond Edmonds worked as a slaughterman at the Wodonga Abattoirs. We know that the way in which she was murdered was similar to a sheep being slaughtered. We know that he was camping on the Victorian side of Tokemall at the time. Evidence could be given that he was there and it's his MO, it's his modus operandi. Based on, I believe he's done at least 30 attacks on women in Victoria, he is a very likely suspect for the murder of Elaine Jones. In 2011, a $100,000 reward was posted uh, for information, seeking information uh, that may lead investigators to arresting the person responsible. Unfortunately, um, no significant information uh, has become available and perhaps the, uh, the only um, person that really knows what happened may well be Raymond Edmonds. I've written to him myself, asking him, and I know he's got the letters, but I've never had a reply. It's just nags at you that, you know, you've got this total belief that he's the offender, but he won't admit it. The tragic case of the murder of Elaine Jones remains unsolved, with only circumstantial evidence linking Raymond Edmonds to the crime. He is also the suspect in several other murders across Victoria. The actions of Raymond Edmonds in 1966 had a profound effect on this area in that people, we didn't feel safe anymore. My thoughts were that I would like to get in the ring with him with no gloves and no one steps in. That was, that was a hatred that I had and, and today I'd do the same. But, Back then it was raw, it was bloody raw. For what he did, the pressure that he put on all the kids in Shep, I would have liked to have throttled him. My brother Ian was badly affected by what had happened. Being an innocent party, it drove him out of that town and he was driven to a life of loneliness. Urca is a very interesting case because we, in this state, Victoria, we still had capital punishment in the 60s. We had a premier, a political leader, who was very keen to win an election by hanging a murderer. And in fact, that premier, Henry Bolte, insisted on hanging a, a prison escapee and murderer called Ronald Ryan. And he became the last man hanged in Australia in 1967. That was precisely when young Urquhart was being wrongly accused of murdering this couple. Had he signed a confession under duress 
and said, I did it, I did it, stop hitting me, he probably would have swung. That boy could have been the last person hanged in Australia and he would have been innocent. It took the conviction of Raymond Edmonds to finally exonerate Ian Urquhart, the tragic figure who for so long had lived under a cloud of suspicion. The forensic work that eventually caught Mr Stinky also meant an evil killer was finally off the streets for good. In the end, this whole case was solved by the scientific police. The ballistics guys, the fingerprint guys, they were the ones that solved it when the old-fashioned detectives who just dragged people in and belted them got nowhere. It was brilliant work by Andy Wall originally and the fact that fingerprints were carefully looked for and located on Gary Hayward's car and preserved and kept and Andy Wall matched them with all the rapes in Melbourne. That was just brilliant, dedicated police work. Had it not been for the development of the fingerprints on the car in Shepparton in 1966, I don't think Edmonds would ever have been charged or connected to the murder of Hayward and Medill, and yeah, potentially could still be at large today. The crimes this man, Raymond Edmonds, has committed are the worst type of horror. They're evil. The murders happened at a time when it caught public imagination, and then the fact that he wasn't caught for almost 20 years caught the public imagination all over again. On every level, he's a monster who deserves to rot in jail.